Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with all of you today. I know there were some that were just coming in uh, from Sunday school and stuff as we gather together. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us, whether you're here with us in-house or whether you're watching and joining us on Facebook. We're glad that you're here to praise and to worship God uh, on this uh, warm summer days uh, as we get through trying to learn the, the routine of what it's going to be like. Uh, we've enjoyed... Uh, getting here, kind of getting settled and situated now, and now we're just trying to figure out what the rhythm of life is going to be as we gather and, and are together. And so we're excited, though, uh, to be here and to continue to move forward with all of our things. Uh, be sure to read about some of the stuff going on through the bulletin and uh, those opportunities. Don't forget that I do still have uh, two weeks of, of signing up over here uh, on the my right side of the sanctuary. There's some clipboards if you'd like to, to meet with me at some point or uh, try to gather together just to talk. Uh, also remember, if there's some um, of our shut-ins that you would really like me to meet, I would really like you to introduce me to them. And so you'd be able to uh, take me and, and introduce me to some of our shut-ins. I would love that uh, because it is a little awkward for a new pastor to come walking into someone who uh, just go, hey, I'm your new preacher. So uh, it's nice to be introduced. So keep that in mind if you're willing to do that. Would love to do that. It doesn't just have to be in the next two weeks either. If, you know, we wait till August somewhere down the line and uh, you're like, hey, I'd really like to take you and introduce you to so-and-so. I'd love to, to figure out a time for that to happen. So uh, get with us and, and set that up and, uh, as we continue through our time together. Uh, so excited again, as I say, to be here. We thank everybody for all the wonderful gifts from uh, last week and the wonderful meal just have really felt like part of the family and welcomed here in Brandon and at Crossgates. And so I want to thank everybody that had a hand in doing all of that. I won't try to name any names because I don't really know any names. So <laughs> we're trying to figure that out as well. But we are glad to be here. So as we begin our worship today, though, if you'd stand and join us as we sing, O Worship the King.
Here we are to worship. If you remain standing for our uh, responsive psalms reading, sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Sound the tambourine. The sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet. A new moon at the full moon on our feast day. For it's the statute of Israel, a rule of God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when we went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I reveal your shoulder of burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you in the waters of Meribah. Here are the There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to foreign gods. I am, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will live. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to your stubborn hearts to follow their own counsel. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I will soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord will cringe toward him, and their fate would last forever. But he who feeds with you harvests the weak, and the honey from the rock will satisfy you. I think you may be seated as we have some special music from Miss Lynn Dickerson.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Judges, chapter 4, verses 14 through 23. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harasheth and Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Haber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came up to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone there? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lies Sisera dead, with a tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin the king of Canaan before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin the king of Canaan until they destroyed Jabin king of Canaan. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We ask our kids to come down now for our children's time as Sherry comes to share with them today. So let's talk for just a minute about plans. Do you ever have your mom or your dad say, we've got plans today. We're going to do this or that or the other. Have you ever thought, ooh, I really like those plans. That's good stuff. I can't wait to do what it is. Anybody ever thought that? And then have you ever thought, once you heard them, you said, hmm, oh, that doesn't sound like what I want to do. I'm not real excited about those plans. Anybody? Yeah? I like to have a plan, and I like to know a plan. I want to tell you about this person right here for just a second. None of you know her. This is my daughter, Madison. Yeah? Can you tell what she's doing here? What's it look like she's dressed up for? What's she play up? Yeah. She's graduating. That's exactly right. So, when she was a senior in high school, they have this thing called Project Graduation. So they graduate from high school, Mom, and then immediately when graduation's over, they get on a bus and they go off with their whole class for one night and they have all these crazy fun things planned for them. But here's the only thing about it. The seniors don't know the plan. They just know there is a plan. And they have to say, yes, I want to do it, sign me up, I want to be a part of it. So the year that Madison graduated from high school, I was crazy. And I'm looking at Sherry Seals because Miss Sherry was part of this plan too. And we planned all the crazy fun things those seniors were going to do that night. They got through with graduation, they jumped on a bus. And about two weeks before that happened, 
they started going, I don't know if I'm going to go. I want to know what the plan is. I want to know, are we doing something fun? Are we going to like what we do? What are we planning to do? And guess what I said? What did I say? Not telling. You'll find out. It's coming. I promise there's a plan. And you're going to enjoy it. But I'm not telling you what it is because it's a surprise. And what they didn't know is that Miss Sherry Seals over here was planning the very first stop they were going to make where they were going to eat to their heart's content. We had it all set up for them. They had a band where they were going to get to dance. They had um, a service project that we did all together to serve the hungry. We had fun. We had service. We had food. It was a night of their lives. But they didn't know the full plan. They just had to say, yes, sign me up. I want to be a part of it. Well, last week, we talked about the people of God in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, where over and over and over again, they would do the same cycle. But here was one of the bottom lines. So, Garrett, will you read that for me? What does my, what does my sign say? Nothing can stop God's plan. That's exactly right. When those seniors started grumbling and they were like, what are we going to do? Is it going to be fun? What's the plan? Can't you tell me? It didn't stop the plan. It was in motion. And it was being put in motion for a purpose. But they didn't know what all the details were. God is the exact same way. He's got a plan. He's got a plan for Hines. He's got a plan for Colby. He's got a plan for Leo. He's got plan for Nora. He's got a plan for Vaughn. He's got a plan for Garrett. All to be part of the work that he does here on this earth. And if we say, God, I'd like to be part of your plan. This sounds pretty cool, but I need to know everything right now. What's God going to say? I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you. I promise there's a plan. I promise there's a purpose. I promise it will work out for good because I'm involved in it. But I'm not going to tell you everything. And so then Leo has a choice. Leo can say, well, if I don't know everything, I'm out. Would you say that to God? Or you might say, okay, God, I trust you. Whatever your plan is, I know it's good. I'm in. I know you will tell me what to do as we go through the, the whole journey together. That's really our only two options. But at the end of the day, say it again, what's this say? Nothing can stop God's plan. And if we say, you know, I'd like to know more and then I'll give you an answer. God can still use us, but he's going to find somebody else who's going to say, yes, God, whatever you need me to do to probably take it over the finish line. Because that's what we have to do is trust that God has a plan. He knows the plan. He's going to let us know that plan when we say what? When we say yes or no to him. When's he going to let us know? When we say yes or when we say no? What's God looking for from us? A yes or a no? He's looking for a yes from us. That's exactly right. So we can be part of his plan. I don't know about you, but it's actually pretty cool to think about. The God that created everything wants me to be part of his plan. You ever thought about that before? Because God's powerful enough, he could say, eh, I'm just going to go, and everything I want done, done. Instead, he says, hey, Colby, I created you to be part of this. Are you in? And if you say yes, I'm with you every step of that way. But at the end of the day, nothing's going to stop my plan. Let's pray. Dear God, we love you. Thank you that you created the whole universe and you still want us to say yes to you and be a part of your plan. Thank you, God, for loving us, for creating us, for including us. Help us to say yes to being a part of your plan for our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.
you can join us for kids worship in the back. Hear the good news. We are forgiven. We are free to be the loving and gracious people who serve and love the Lord with gladness. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Let's stand and sing. turn to your neighbor and greet them with the peace of Christ as we have an opportunity to go to the back where the uh, black boxes are to drop our offering in, an opportunity to go to the Lord and say, Lord, here is what I'm giving and returning to you as I give you your tithe and my offering. I pray that you would take it and use it to further your word into the world and then take a moment to greet your neighbor with the peace of Christ. some commotion and gathering and fellowship, for fellowship is an important aspect of our time together, for us to gather together and to talk and to share and an opportunity to return to God what is God's. And as we take a moment now to reflect as we listen to a, a song that was requested, Give Me Jesus, take some time to think about the wonderful gift that God has given us as we have just returned a portion of the blessings that he has given us.
Amen. We'll take time now to go to the Lord in prayer. We have our uh, book that's been filled out, and uh, so we do have some uh, concerns, but there aren't any praises, but I know there's got to be some good things going on. So what are some praises? What do we, have we, where have we seen God at work in the world? Anybody got a light of Christ they want to share? JC got a job this week, so we're excited about that. That's a wonderful thing. Anybody else? Carl Tudor is improving. Carl Tudor is improving, and so we're excited about that. Regular room now. Leroy Miller is supposed to be coming home today, from what I understand. Any others? Beautiful music that we had today, opportunity to fellowship, and just the fact that we're able to gather together is always a great and wonderful thing, and so, so excited to, to be here. We also want to carry some of our concerns. Uh, some of the concerns that are written here is uh, Mary Matz, uh, sister of Kim. Is that Mads? Is that... Mots, Mots, uh, so has some seizures. Uh, Mona Touchstone is having a liver transplant. Judy Hines for healing, a family of Kathy Boney. And Carl Tudor uh, for a surgery and uh, his recovery. Do we have some other concerns that maybe we didn't put in the book that we want to have lifted up right now? Bill, Bill Hanky? Hammond. Hammond, Bill Hammond. All right, traveling mercies for Jordan. They're traveling. All right, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and are so thankful for all the wonderful blessings that you've given us in our lives. We're thankful for the gift of your son, Jesus, that he came, he lived, he died. Most of all, that he rose again, defeating sin and death so that we could have life, so that we have an opportunity to come to you, Lord, to have this relationship with you. For we know that you are God and we are not, that you are holy, and although we strive, we often fall short of that. We thank you that Jesus came so that we can have this relationship, so that we can bring these concerns that are on our hearts and on our minds, knowing that your hands are going to be at work in each and every one of those, knowing that as we lift up those that we are concerned about that are sick in need of your healing hands, that you'll also offer those. We just pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us in this life, Lord. Help us to take time to stop and to see how you are at work in our lives. To know that, that it, we don't lift these things up to empty ears or empty hands. But that they are hands full of love and grace and mercy. Willing and waiting to love us and care for us in whatever way might be needed. All we have to do is ask. Help us to continue to do so, Lord. And then as we ask and as we receive, Lord, help us to realize and to know and to share that time. Help us to... Uh, change our lives so that we can be the people you need us to be so that maybe we can start answering some of those prayers of others those that are in need of, of help and caring and kindness Lord help us to do those things help us to be the people that you've called us to be for we know in this lost and broken world we often get very selfish and turned in upon ourselves help us in those moments to stop and to ask for forgiveness knowing that you will surely offer it because of the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We take time now to pray all of these things in his name. He taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And us not into temptation. Deliver us in the name. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So again, we gather together. Uh, for those that may not know, we know it's been a couple of times. I'll probably stop this at some point, but I'm Robbie Merton, and we're glad to be here. Uh, appointed now. We're three weeks in, or three Sundays anyway, and uh, glad to be sharing uh, in this time as we come together. Uh, for those that weren't here last week, though, we talked about, anybody remember his name? Ehud. That's right, Ehud. Now, my wife gives me a little bit of a hard time. She's like, you know, you pick some kind of morbid stories to be talking about in the beginning. But, but you got to get beyond some of the morbidness. I understand it is, right? Even Kim was like, 
and then he died. You know, <clears throat> she read the story, right? Uh, probably going to happen if you have a tent spake driven through your temple. But uh, we got to get beyond some of those things because this isn't that God is calling us to assassinate the king or, you know, your boss or to put a tent, tent uh, spike through someone's temple. But it is about answering God when he calls and about knowing that we are equipped with whatever it might be. And so last week when we talked about Ehud being left-handed, right, it's because he had this quirkiness that he was left-handed and he was in the right place at the right time and he set his plan out and put it into action and worked through it so that he could fulfill God's plan of salvation so that they were delivered and had 80 years of peace as he goes through this. We all need to answer and to, to figure out our plan and to put it in action. It doesn't just mean to, to rush right in rashly, but to take some time to pray and discern, God, where are you leading us? What is this looking like? What is our next faithful step? Figure out that plan and then put it into action. That's what we want to be about. That's what we want to do. That's what Ehud teaches us. This week we hear from Deborah as she gathers a team to defeat the enemies of Israel because once again, they do evil in the eyes of the Lord. So she's another one of those judges we see answering God's call that teaches us how to follow through, how to put it together, how to figure out what it is God wants me to do and then how to do it. Because sometimes we hear what God wants me to do and we're like, yeah, God, that's too hard. I'm not doing that. Sometimes it's scary. But today we learn that you don't have to do it alone. That whatever God calls you to do, there is a way to call a team together, to put together, to make it all fall into places. And so I'm going to go back and read the beginning of chapter 4. You heard Kim kind of finish up the end of it. And so I'm going to go back and to read the beginning about who Deborah is and about how she first calls Barak. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord took sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, re -re regain, uh, reigned in Hazar. Sisera, the commander of his armies, was based in Harasheth, Hagoyim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried out to the Lord for help. 20 years. You think it took them 20 years before they asked for help? Any of us do that? We wait 20 years before we ask God for help? Something else to think about, food for thought. Now, Deborah was a prophet, the wife of Lipidoth, who was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinam and Kadesh in Naphthi, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, Take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tobar. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him up into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you do not go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There, Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command, and Deborah also went with them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So once again, we see that the Israelites are caught up in this vicious cycle, right? This cycle of, of we've got some peace, so things are going well. And when things go well, sometimes we forget our need for God. And so then we drift away, right? Because when things are, are hard and, and we're struggling, we're crying out to God because we're being oppressed. But when things are going well, we, oh, I don't need God. And so we find ourselves in this cycle where we drift away from God. You know, and here, once again, we see the Israelites being boneheads, drifting away from God. And so, therefore, they are oppressed once again. They are taken over by Jabin, king of Canaan. Maybe not uh, the best theology of how that works, if God punishing and taking care of, and if it's God or if it's not God, or if God just withdraws his blessing is where it is. Lots of other theological conversations to be had there. But just know that we all find ourselves in this cycle at some time, how it works, what it may be. But the question comes back to how do you cry out to God? And when you cry out to God, how do you 
answer his call when he gives you the answer? How do you respond to these things? What is it that you do? So after 80 years of, of peace that Ehud brought, we are introduced to Deborah. And she's called a prophetess who is now leading Israel at this time. And so what does a prophet do? What is a prophet supposed to do? It's supposed to bring the word of God to the people, right? A prophet says, this is what God is telling us. This is where we are. And Deborah had to be pretty well respected. I mean, it even tells us later on that, that the Israelites would bring their disputes and let her judge between them. And so trusting her judgment means we're trusting where she's leading us, where she's guiding us, what she's telling us to do and what we need to do. And so here it's clear that we see that she is leading or guiding, however it may be. The NIV says that, that she's leading them. The NRSV says that she's judging them. And, and either way, she is in charge and they're coming to her asking, what does God want us to do? We're crying out now. We've realized that we've messed up, that we've drifted away, that we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Tell us. How do we find that peace that we had before? Because we kind of like that a lot better than being oppressed. We kind of like having the peace of knowing that God is taking care of us. More so than where we are right now. So this text tells us that she calls Barak. Because God tells her, Barak is going to deliver our people. And so she calls him up and he comes to her. Which again, probably being a military guy coming to a prophet of God. A woman, it's probably something to kind of question a little bit, but he does and he comes to her and she says, God's telling us it's time. God's going to answer the call. We need you to go and to do these things and to go and to share. And so Barak comes and he shows up and she's like, all right, it's time. What are you going to do? And Barak says, well, I tell you what, if you go with me, right, if you come with me, then I'll know that it's of God and I'll know that, that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I wanna make sure that I'm following the right steps. And so then there kind of becomes a question of who the real deliverer is, right? Like, is Deborah the one that hears God and is sharing it or she calls for this help of, of Barak? And so there's some of these questions. But then we also see down the line that after Barak has kind of routed the army and there's you know, lots of different conversations about what happens to his 900 chariots that it rained really hard so they get stuck in the mud and they can't go anywhere and so that's how the Israelites overthrow them. So once again, something God has done has led and, and really done the defeat of the battle. But they get him on the run and Sisera is running away and he runs to the house of Jael who invites him in, lays him down, who has peace with his commander, Jabin. We're not sure, maybe she's an Israelite. We're not real sure. We know that she's married to a Kenite. But she invites him in. And then she takes care of him. And then when Barak comes looking for him, Jael says, come, this is the man you're looking for. I have subdued him for you. So you get caught up. So, so is Deborah the one that brings peace? Is Barak the one that brings peace? Or is Jael the one that brings peace? Who is the judge here? The prophetess, the military leader, or Jael, the housewife who was in the right place at the right time. We get caught up in all of these things and I would say and venture a guess that the answer is all of them. Because folks, it takes a team. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? Teamwork makes the dream work. You gotta have teamwork for this. It takes all three of them. Deborah probably is not going to win it all by herself. I mean, even Ehud, who laid the plan and made the assassination, but he had to come back and rally the troops. He doesn't really do it all himself. He needed help. And here we see Deborah saying, you know, I'm pretty good at judging. I'm pretty good at listening to God and telling people what God is saying. But I don't know nothing about the military. I don't know how to defeat 900 iron chariots. And so she calls on Barak, who has that gift, who has that talent, and says, hey, I need you to be on my team. Can you come and do this? And then again, we see JL being at the right place at the right time. That is used. That's what we've got to have. That's why we've got to have teamwork here. It's got to be something where we're working together and we're all kind of figuring out where we're going, like to find that new vision, to cast a new vision. Where are we going? What are we doing? How are we going to get there? It takes a team. 
It took a team to deliver Israel, and it takes a team for us to build God's kingdom here in Brandon at Crossgates. It takes a team for us to fulfill this purpose, to move in the right direction, to do the right things. They all have to humble themselves and, and play their role. Deborah can't stand up and say, I don't need Barack. Barack's not important. I can rally the troops. Maybe she could have. Maybe she wouldn't have. Barack can say, well, I don't really need Deborah. I'm going to leave her here and I'm going to take all the glory for myself. But he doesn't because he says, I want to have the word of God right there with me. I want to make sure that we're doing what God wants us to do and not just following what I want to do. JL could have just not told him, said, oh yeah, no one's there. Could have just left him there. Could have let Cicero gain his strength and, and go back out and fight on another day. She's not looking for glory. She's looking for peace. She's looking to do the will of God. That's what we all need to be doing. Barak is needed, so Deborah calls him. He says, Barak, I need you to come and to share with me. Barak, I need you to be on this journey with me in what we're doing. Now, I think Barak gets a bad rap because very often when you think about Barak, people kind of give him a hard time as if he didn't have enough faith, you know, It'd kind of be like if I came up and said, hey, I need you to go do X, Y, Z. And then you just go do it without any questions. You know, but Barack kind of says, well, I might need some help, Robbie. Can you, can you give me some resources? Can you help me out do this? Can you do these things? That's all that's going on here. Deborah, uh, Deborah calls in Barack and says, hey, God's called you to go and to deliver Israel today. And he says, only if you go with me. And so we're kind of look at him as ye of little faith. God just called you. She just told you. She's a prophet. She's telling you to go. Why don't you go? But I think maybe there's more to this story behind Barak as to what's going on. In the NIV, it says, because of the way you're going about this, the honor will not be yours. As if that's what he, the only reason he's there. And maybe it is. He is a military guy. So sometimes we may think that it is about honor and glory a little bit more. The NRSV kind of softens it a little bit and says, the road you're on will not lead you to glory. Right? The path you're taking, it's not going to be about you, but, but maybe Barack is bigger than we think and more humble than we think. Perhaps Barack, Barack realizes, I need someone to come alongside of me. I need Deborah to be there to make sure that I'm following God's will because I don't want to misstep. I need someone that is a little bit farther down the road than me. I need that mentor who can talk to God and share with God and, and discern what God is leading and where he's leading. That's what I need in my life. So maybe that's where Barack is. So he needs Deborah and he's not so concerned about the glory and the honor and who wins. He just wants peace for Israel. He can humble himself and says, it's not about me as the military leader. I can give the glory to you or I can give it to someone else like J.L. who eventually gets it. And then we see J.L. who is at home. How does she fit into this team approach? I mean, if Deborah doesn't tell Barack to go and Barack doesn't go, then how does J.L. fit into it at all? Well, she may not. But because they did, it got the ball rolling and then they brought her on as well. And so J.L. is a key, integral part of the story. You know, she's, she's a homemaker that just is in the right place at the right time to be a little hospitable at first, but then to do what needs to be done so that Israel could have the defeat of their enemies, so that Israel could have the peace that comes. Sister wouldn't have been on the run if Barak wasn't there. Barak wouldn't have been there if Deborah wasn't there. And J.L. would not have been able to do what she did if she wasn't there. You see how all three fit together in this story to make God's plan of salvation for the Israelites happen? For God to be able to deliver them, they all had to play their roles and their parts and to fit into where it is and what they were doing. And because they worked together and didn't fuss about individual glory, we don't know, maybe he did say something back to Deborah, but it's not written that Barak kind of says, oh, well, you know, if that's the case, then Deborah, you just stay here. No, he says, come. And she went. And they had the defeat of their enemies. 
It's about this team working together, going to do the right thing in the right place at the right time. The same thing is true here thousands of years later. We need to take time to discern the will of God, to figure out what's going on, to be here, to be a part of things, how God can work and use us together as a team to make it happen. It shouldn't be about the glory. It's not about, oh, well, the bishop sent Robbie Murden to Crossgates and Crossgates all of a sudden started doing really, really well. And look how good Robbie is. It's not about that. At least for me, it's not. I don't want it to be. I would just want to see the success of Crossgates as a church moving forward, making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And I know that I cannot do it by myself. I can work hard. I can run myself in the ground. But if we have a team, life's going to be so much better for all of us and the way it's going to be. And I don't care if someone gets the credit here or someone gets the credit here. It's not about, look how good Robbie is as a preacher. It's about, look at Crossgates, United Methodist Church, making disciples of Jesus Christ. That's making a difference in Brandon and Rankin County and hopefully beyond in the world. That's what we want to be about, kingdom-mindedness. Not that, well, you know, our youth group is bigger than Crossgates Baptist, or we do this better than First, we do this better than Galloway, or whatever. It's not about that. It's not about bragging. It's about kingdom-mindedness. What they're doing there is great, and they're bringing people to Christ, and that's what we want to be about. We need to do that together. It takes all of us working together as this team to do the things that we're called to do. You see, even God works in a team, right? We all know about the Trinity. Even God works in this Trinity, right? God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Y'all learning, you get to talk a little bit sometimes, right? God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity works together as a team, right? We know it's three in one. We know there is God. There is God and God works. But within that, the three work perfectly. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that, that realize they all have their parts, they all do their things, but they work together. And they set that example for us, how we're supposed to be a team, how we work together to go and to make it through all the things we're supposed to do. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Deborah, Barak, and Jael, and all of us here at Crossgates to build God's kingdom I know I can't do it alone, and even if I were good enough, which I'm not, to do it by myself, I wouldn't want to, because that's a lot of hard work. Many hands make like the work, and it's so much better and so much easier if we work together, if we come together on a common goal and say, we're all going to go in this direction, and this is the way we want to go. Find out what that is, and then everybody going in the same way, because far too often we end up tug of war and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It takes a team for us to work together. It takes a team for us to move God's kingdom, to build God's kingdom here in what we do. I feel a little bit like Barack maybe here. We have the bishop in the cabinet kind of as, as Deborah that, that kind of are praying about and trying to figure out what pastors are going where and where they're going. And then I'm the Barack that shows up because I've been sent, been called by the cabinet to say, you go to Crossgates and lead and guide. But that's not the end of the story. There's also some JLs. And folks, I need y'all to be the JLs. I'll do the hard work. I'll do what I'm called to do. I'll do my part. I'll roll up my sleeves and, and get out there and do what I've been asked by the bishop and the cabinet to do. But I need you all, the people, the church. Not this building. This building isn't Crossgates. You are Crossgates United Methodist Church. And I need you to step up and do, to answer God's call. To, to lead and guide, to discern what it is that you're supposed to be doing. What does that look like? Where are we going with all of these things? What are we supposed to do? As an ordained, ordained clergy in the United Methodist Church, we're ordained, meaning that we're set apart. That's kind of us answering the call, that we're set apart to basically four things. Right? So we're called to bring order to the church. What that means is making sure that there's leaders in 
charge, that there's leadership, that there's good planning, that we're, we're financially uh, stable, that we are taking care of all, of being good stewards of all that God has given us to make sure that that's happening. And again, that's not just the preacher doing that. I'm not called to do all of that by myself, but to lead in that and to guide in that. That's where we need some JLs to serve on finance and trustees and administrative board to be a part of those things. You know, I'm called to bring the sacraments to make sure that we have those opportunities to stay in love with God like we talked about on that first Sunday. To make sure that we have an opportunity to bring people into the body of Christ through baptism. To make sure that we have the, the right ways and the right rituals and the, and the right opportunities to be a part of the right theology of what it means for us to have communion and have that opportunity to stay in love with God and to bring people in through baptism to the body of Christ. I'm called to word, to, to bring the word, to preach and to teach, but I'm not the only one that is here to preach and teach. I'm called to make sure that we're, we're following Wesleyan theology that, that we're going through and, and trying to make sure that we know what the difference is and what it means to be a United Methodist. And then, of course, I'm called to serve because it's not all about me getting the glory. Sometimes it is about me rolling up my sleeves and picking up chairs and tables and moving them. And I promise you, when it's called for that, I'll do that. You can ask my kids. They've been asked to do it their whole lives. And they're like, one day, Dad, we're going to go somewhere and we ain't got to do this. And I was like, that ain't never happening. <laughs> You've always got to move tables and chairs and someone's got to do it. You know? I'm on staff at the happening and Britt happens to be big brother over here. He's like going to crawl under the bleachers now. Uh, but uh, he's big brother and he talked about how someone came and just swept all the time and just kept cleaning up and cleaning up and cleaning up and it just seemed like, you know, that was their task. That was what they did and that was so helpful and such a great thing that they felt like I was a part of the team. Sometimes that's what it is. It may not always be glorious. You may not always get to stand in front, but someone with a broom, someone dragging a chair around, putting a table up, that's all part of the team. You may not serve on the committee you want to be on, or you may not serve on this group or that group. You may not be able to do this or that. But I promise you there's something that God has for each and every one of you to be a part of ministry and mission at Crossgate United Methodist Church. And if there's not, then come talk to me because we got to find something. We, we can certainly figure something out, not just to be busy, but to make sure that it fits into the plan, that it fits into the vision, that we are all moving in the right direction at the right time and where we go. Doing the will of God is a team effort. Even Jesus created a team. Even Jesus, the Son of God, when he came to earth, he didn't like, ah, I'm going to do this all by myself. I don't need anybody. That's not what he did. The Messiah, the chosen one, the Son of God. I need 12 people to help me get this done. And those 12 turned into millions down the, through the years. So how about it? You willing to step up? You willing to serve? You willing to be that JL that comes alongside of Deborah and Barack to make our vision come true, to move in the right direction, what we need to do and what we want to do? We're still working through what that is. And my onboarding, one of the questions that was there was like, well, so what's your vision for Crossgates? And I told them, honestly, I don't have one, which may sound a little depressing. But I don't have one because I don't know Crossgate yet. I don't know all of you yet. I don't know what your gifts and grace are. I don't know what we're supposed to be doing. That's why I can't do it by myself. Hopefully at some point we'll gather a group of folks together and we'll be able to talk and to share about where we are, about where we want to be. Because... Your past, what you've done in the past, where you are in the past, what you want to be in the future tells you what you should be doing right now. Right? Your past plus your future equals your present. And so we'll be able to come together and start figuring out what our vision is and we'll know where that picture of our preferred future is that that's where we want to get to. And once we know where we want to get to, then we can start trying to figure out the routes. Do we go around this way? Do we go around this way? Do we just plow through the middle? And that's something that I can't do, and I promise I won't do by myself. That's something we've got to do together. Because the body of Christ has many parts with many gifts and many graces. And that's what we're supposed to be about. That's what we're supposed to be going through and doing with all of these different teams, with all these different gifts. 
Like it says in 1 Peter 4.10, it says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve one another. So start thinking about what is my quirkiness, my left-handed quirkiness to plan out? What is my part on the team? Am I the prophet that can, can pray and really have a great discerning heart on what direction we need to go in? Am I the military leader that just rolls up my sleeve and can run out to, and face 900 chariots? Am I JL that sits waiting until the right time and then I'm in the right time at the right place to fulfill God's plan? There's a spot on this team for all of us. It's about finding where that is because God has a call on your life to do something. Not to just sit in the pew on Sunday morning, not to just say, Jesus, I love you as my Lord and Savior. When I die, I'm going to heaven, I'm good. There's a lot of time between now and when you're going to heaven. What are you gonna do with that time? How will you become part of the team that makes a difference, that begins to build God's kingdom, that brings more and more people to the team, more and more people to the body of Christ? That's what we're called. That's what we wanna be about here at Crossgates, building God's kingdom. Folks, I can't do it alone. I can't even do it with the staff that you've given me, as great and wonderful as they are. One of the things I hope I never hear, well, don't we pay them to do that? Because you don't pay us to do that. You pay us to lead and to guide. You pay us to be part of the team leading and guiding you to do that. We're all called to it. Don't say, oh, well, you know, Faith's got the youth. We don't have to worry about them. Sherry's got the kids. We don't got to worry about them. Kim's got music. I don't have to do that. It's not true. They all need help all the time. What part of the team will you be on? What part of the team are you going to share in this time? When we think about the Trinity that works together as a team, the bishop and the appointed clergy and the churches and the clergy in the churches, and the church leadership, and all of you that are sitting in the pews. These teams of three that are here to build God's kingdom to make a difference. And for us, it starts right here in this building with each of us, building this team together to make a difference. But it's not just about staying in here. We want to go out of these doors. Send these teams out to make a difference into Brandon and Rankin County and beyond so that people can come to know who God is, who Jesus Christ is as their Lord and Savior. But we need you to do it. So will you be part of this team? Amen. Our final song is Weave a Story to Tell to the Nation, and I picked it really because of that first word. We have a story to tell. Not Robbie the preacher, not Kim the music person or Faith the kid per youth person or Sherry the children's person. Not the staff, not the bishop, not the cabinet. We, the collective we, as we talk about in our church. I guess we're not really doing it now. Our other bishop, the power of we, that we can make a difference. Not just one of us, but all of us to make a difference. Stand and join us as we sing.
God's kingdom on earth. We say that all the time in the Lord's prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that his will be done. We can only do that when we work together as a team. And so I pray and that I hope that as we continue to move forward, to continue to make a difference in our community and in our world, as we continue to, to figure out that vision, continue to pray about where God is leading us to, to hear the prophets that are telling us what we need to do, to have the military folks that can roll up their sleeves and make it happen in the jails to fulfill the plan so that we can build God's kingdom here at Crossgates. Will you join the team? I hope so. As we go now in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.